Amen. So um, I want to welcome you today. If you don't know me, I'm Pastor Mike Sainz, the lead pastor here at the harbor, and I'm delighted to see you here today. Um, and today's a special day because um, today is the day we have earmarked to bring Christ's birthday offering. How about that? And we're going to do that in a little bit, so uh, I'm going to preach the message first, actually. And so, um, but I want you to join me in prayer, though, right now, because we've got a number of people that are, that are sick right now during the holidays, and how many of you know you can't decide when you're going to get sick? None of us would ever decide to, would we? No. But nonetheless, Kelly's sick, she's down with the flu, and she hates to miss church. In fact, she don't miss church unless she just can't come. So I want you to join me in prayer for her and... Um, there's many others, too, that are sick. I know Brother Stanley has been really sick, and different ones, but I, I want us to just join together in a word of prayer for that. Before we go, um, can you just join me in prayer right now for not only those, but you may know some that are sick as well. Father, we just come to you right now, and we thank you for this opportunity to, to come to your house and to worship you together, to uh, join together in faith, Lord, for those that are sick, those that are hurting. Lord, I just believe you, God, that you're going to have your way in our service today, that you're going to meet with us here in this place, and God, that when we're done, Lord, that you'll be glorified and lifted high. And so thank you, Lord, for this time we have to come together, and I'm excited and I'm expecting, Lord, what you're going to do today. And the church said, amen. amen. So God bless you. We've had a wonderful, wonderful time uh, last week, we had just a blowout kids' Christmas presentation from the Harbor Kids Department. Check this out, 768 people in the house. We ought to give the Lord praise for that. And if that wasn't enough, on Santa and s'mores, how about this? Now, Sister um, um, Brenda Patterson led this movement and uh, Emory. But uh, Brenda was in charge of this overall uh, ordeal, and Santa and S'mores was a huge success. Another over 600 people filed through here to see Santa Claus and have their picture taken and yada, yada, yada. Now, please don't be mistaken if you're here for the first time and think this church is all about Santa Claus. We understand Santa Claus is that, but we give glory to God and the greatest gift ever given to man, that is Jesus Christ. And we're going to, matter of fact, preach a message this morning about the birth of Christ. But I would be remiss if I didn't just brag on some of the things that have happened and just say a big hats off to Emory and to Brenda and Kelly Patterson who made that happen the other night. And then the kids program and the Sunday before that was the Christmas cantata. And uh, Adam led that with um, uh, Amber and just... Uh, my hat's off to everyone. So can we give them another big hand, would you? I do want to mention something. I'm going to mention it now, and I'm going to mention it again, and then our host, Brother Mike, is going to mention it before y'all leave. And that is next Sunday, the 30th, there will only be one service. It'll be at 1030. So if you get here at 9, we're going, we still have things ready. I mean, we'll have the coffee made, and you can come and pray till 1030. But don't leave. There's only one service next week. And so I would urge you to be here a little bit early, though, to just get a good seat. Because it should be a packed house trying to bring us all under one roof at the same time. So <clears throat> enough about that. Um, this morning, if the Lord would help me, I would like to go down the road, if I may, of talking about the biblical facts of Christmas. Now, we don't know that Jesus was born on the 25th of December, and it really doesn't matter. That's the day we have chosen as a people to, to honor and, you know, to pay respect uh, and identify the day that we celebrate that he came. It's really not important that he came December the 1st or January the 1st or, or December 25th or whenever. The, the fact is that he came. Are you with me? Because Paul the Apostle said, if he did not come and sacrifice and die and be raised from the dead, then we are still in our sins. So thank God he came. So I want to give you the biblical facts this morning, and I really have more, more preaching than I've got time. But I, so I won't linger too long in any particular spot, but I just want to give you three particular facts this morning, and then I want to ask you one question. And so that sounds real simple. Leave it to a preacher to make it longer than it should be. 
But nonetheless, the first of the three facts is this, that God gave us his word through the prophets of the coming Messiah. Now here's what you under, need to understand, that God created man in his own image. We understand that way back in the Garden uh, of Eden. You remember that? He created us. He created the trees and the plants and the birds and all that was there. And he put us in the garden. He gave us dominion over the garden. And he said, you could do everything you wanted. You could eat anything except this one tree. Y'all with me? You can't eat of this. And so, of course, you know the story. They did eat of that tree. And then God come in the garden and he, he asked him about it. Yeah, we did eat of the tree and we're scared now because now we realize that we're naked and we're afraid because of what you're going to do. And so God killed an animal and made skins for them. He made clothes for them. But here's something else that happened to them. They gave up on that day the Eden that they lived in. On that day, they gave up this ground that yielded its strength. And uh, the, these, these herbs and vegetables and everything that was there, they also gave up this paradise of God. Because the Bible says God escorted them out with their new clothes, if you will, and he put them outside the garden, and he placed a cherub angel at the entrance there so that they could not come back into the garden. And if you remember, there was a curse upon the woman because of taking of this fruit. A curse come upon her, and she said, now it's going to hurt to have children. Ladies, can I identify with you? Can has anybody had any babies? You understand it hurts? It's going to hurt to have uh, for childbearing and so forth. And then he says, man, it's gonna, uh, I'm going to put a curse on you too. In the sweat of your brow, you'll till the ground until you return to the ground from whence you came. Are you all with me? Now, how many of you know, brothers, in the sweat of your brow that you're going to till the earth and you're going to work the earth? And then he says, the earth, you're cursed as well. Thorns and thistles will infest the ground. There was not thorns before. You could just dive into a bed of roses. And it, it, but now if you do that, you're going to bleed. And it's going to remind you of the blood of Christ that it takes to bring us back in a relationship with God. And that's my ecology. I don't know if you'll find it in a book nowhere. I'm just telling you, thorns now infest the ground. Berries that have thorns now, at one time there wasn't. And he said, so there's a curse upon the woman, a curse upon the man, a curse upon the earth. It will not yield its strength. Have you ever tried to grow a garden? Let me see your hand. You know what you got to do now? You got to buy pounds and pounds of fertilizer and nitrous and uh, all uh, nitrogen and all of these things. Why? Because we got to make the earth try to grow. Because it don't yield the strength that it used to. So a curse upon the woman, a curse upon the man, a curse upon the earth. And then he says to the snake who used to walk upright, cursed you are and upon your belly you'll eat dust all the days of your life and man will bruise your head. I proved that last month. I found a timber rattler on my front porch. And I bruised his head so bad that it's not even attached to his body no more. But anyway, <laughs> man will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. You understand? And there's enmity between humankind and the snake, if you will. But Now, God did create the snake, so don't get freaked out about that. He did create. But anyway, so what I'm saying is there's a curse upon the man, the woman, the earth, and the snake. And then there's a separation from God. We could not be in the presence of God because sin separated us from God. Are you with me? And for years and years and years, even when man died, when Adam died, when Noah died, when all of these Old Testament guys died, they couldn't, their, even their spirit could not go back and be in the presence of God, but they were held in a place called paradise in the lower parts. You know, there's a great gulf right here, paradise over here, and hell over here. How about that? But in the Bible says that when Jesus came to this earth, all things changed. So I wanted to show you the importance of his coming because if he did not come, we could have never gone back into the presence of God because sin had separated us from God. But because of the gift of God, how many of you know the Bible says every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights? Every good and perfect gift comes down from him. So God gave us what? His only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let me jump ahead real quick because if I get into this, I might forget to tell you. But when Jesus came, you know, he's, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But when he died, you know what the Bible says? They put his body in a tomb. But you know what? That was his body. You know what Jesus, where his spirit was? Uh, he went down to the lower parts where there was hell on the one side, the great gulf, and then paradise. Where Paradise means orchard of God. It's like the Eden of God. And the devil had control. Satan had control. He couldn't hurt them, but they could not be free to be back with their creator. 
But the Bible says Jesus came down to preach deliverance. Uh huh. Now I'm going to tell you this real quick because I got to get them a message. But this is a side note. So here's paradise, and the Bible says, Jesus, you know what Jesus said to the thief on the cross? You remember when he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom? This day thou shalt be with me. Where? In paradise. Jesus said, I'm headed somewhere as soon as I leave this hill right here. As soon as this is all over, they'll take my body down and wrap it up and put it in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. But for three days, I got a mission trip to take down to paradise to tell the devil to let my people go who have been there for thousands of years since the Garden of Eden. It's important that Jesus came. He was destined to die. So he came and, you know, all of this happened and... and but, but I know you want a little bit more proof. So Jesus said this when he was preaching one day. He says, um, uh, as Jonah was in the belly of the fish or the whale for three days, even so I, the Son of Man, must be in the heart of the earth for three days. Huh? That's right. Well, another one, since you're wondering. He said to the, the uh, officials that day, he said, this, um, you destroy this temple and I'll raise it in three days. Well, standing near the temple, they thought he's talking about the temple the, that they had built. They said, for 46 years we built this temple, and you'll raise it in three days. However, he spoke not of the temple made with hands. He spoke of his own body. So one more proof real quick before we dive back into the message. Paul said, who is he that ascended up on high, but first descended to the lower parts and preached deliverance to the captives? Just so you know. So it was important that Jesus come. So I want to show you these three facts. I told you it takes a preacher a little while. to. So the three facts, number one, the word of God prophesied the coming of the Messiah. Hundreds and hundreds of years. Let me break that down for you. Matter of fact, way back in Deuteronomy, uh, Moses said in Deuteronomy that it would be a Messiah, would be a prophet like unto himself, like unto Moses. Hosea said, that he would be born and that he would go down into Egypt and that he would be called out of Egypt. Uh, David said in the Psalms that he would be called God's son. He further said that he, in, in Psalm 110 and 1 through 4, he said that he would even be greater than David. And to tell the Israelites there would be a king greater than David would be something serious. And so then Malachi says that he would be preceded by John the Baptist. And Genesis, Moses wrote this, the scepter will never depart from Judah. Well, why, what makes sense of that? You say, Judah, Jesus, Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. Let me help you again real quick for those who don't know. There was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob, I mean, all these are the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob had 12 boys. <laughs> One of them's name was Judah. These 12 boys led the 12 tribes of Israel. There was Reuben, Dan, and Gad, and uh, Naphtali, and Manasseh, and Issachar, and Simeon, and Asher. And Y'all with me? Anyway, these, one of them's name was Judah. So Judah was the head of the tribe of Judah. That's why they called Jesus the lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen. So, man, we're making some headway this morning. But so the scepter will never depart from Judah. Genesis 3 says that he would be the seed of a woman. Genesis 12 says the Messiah would be the descendant of Abraham. Here's Isaiah, my, pre, my favorite prophet who spoke of, uh, of the coming of the Messiah would be Isaiah. Isaiah said in 7 and 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. In Isaiah 9 and 6 and 7, that he went further. He said he would be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Um, matter of fact, Isaiah said in chapter 11 and in verse 53 that he would be called a Nazarene. Now, isn't it amazing to me that because of Herod's terror and his rule that he turned down into Egypt but then when Herod died and his son Archelaus reigned in his sight uh, or in his stead, he come up out of Egypt. But fearing this, he turned into a little town called Nazareth. Why? The prophets had said he would be a, a Nazarene, that he would come from Nazareth, that he would have gone down into Egypt and returned. Let me move on. Isaiah 9 says this. 
The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in the land of the deep darkness, a light will shine. You will enlarge the nation of Israel, and its people will rejoice. Let me step down to verse number 6 for time's sake. For unto us a child is born, a son is given. The government will rest on his shoulders. Thank you, Lord. It ain't on the Democrats or the Republicans. <coughs> because they couldn't find their behind with both hands. Are you with me? Say amen. That wasn't in my Christmas notes, if y'all are wondering. <laughs> As he will be called Wonderful and Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. His government, and, and watch this, his government and its peace will never end. And he will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all of eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. Isn't that amazing? And then in verse 11, or chapter 11, verse 1, he said, watch this, a shoot will come forth from the stump of Jesse. Jesse was David's father. He said, uh, uh, and from roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel uh, and of might. And the spirit of knowledge and, and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. And he will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide with by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness he will judge the needy. And the justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. How about that? Isn't it amazing the amount of scripture, the amount of prophecy about the Messiah hundreds of years? Isaiah spoke 720 years before Christ was born. You know, I'm only 52 years old, but 700 is a pretty good while. Y'all with me? So, and then Micah, my, my little grandson named after Micah. But Micah said, But thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Ephrata, though you are smallest among the clans of Judah, out of thee shall come one called ruler. Are you with me? Watch this. So he says he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Now, I, I got another prophecy. This is going to blow your mind right here. But this takes us all the way back to the book of Numbers. Y'all remember the book of Numbers? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, the fourth book. The fourth book, way back then. Now, of course, I've already quoted from the first book. So, anyway, but Numbers, here we got a guy by the name of Balaam. Now, Balaam was a um, kind of a sham prophet, if you will. I mean, uh, he reminded me of some of our TV people. Uh, anyway, uh, he could easily be convinced to try to say words that really God didn't say. Are you with me? So, uh, a guy by the name of Balak, of Belpeor, hired him to, to come and prophesy against Israel. And, and I, I wish I had time to tell you, but I don't. But for three times, he went to different places, and God had told him not to go. <clears throat> God told him not to go, but he went anyway. How many times have you been guilty of that? Don't raise your hand. God said, don't go, but he went anyway. Because the man promised him a big pile of money if he'd go and prophesy and curse the children of Israel. So he kept making excuses. He wanted to appease God, but he wanted the money. Huh? So, but anyway, he's on his way, and, and every time he opened his mouth to curse Israel, he would speak things like, there's the children of Israel growing uh, upon the plains, multiplying, and God's hand is upon them, and yada, yada. Man, he'd start talking, and all of a sudden, uh, this guy would say, I thought I, I, I'm hiring you to curse them, and it sounds like you're blessing them to me. And he'd turn around and say, I can't say anything other than God has told me. In other words, I mean, I wasn't even supposed to be here. But, but, and then he'd, he'd bring them somewhere else, and he'd open his mouth, and he'd begin to bless them. He'd bring them somewhere else, and he'd look from a different mountain, and he'd begin to bless them. Well, and now God punished him for all of this. He almost killed him, to be honest with you. But if it hadn't been for his donkey, he would have killed him. But, but anyway, all of a sudden, he said something that really mattered. And how many of you know that God can speak through anyone or anything? Matter of fact, it wasn't but just a chapter or two early. He opened the mouth of a donkey and spoke clear words from the mouth of a donkey. Uh, anyway, I got a series coming up on that next year, so y'all need to stay tuned. But anyway, Balaam began to prophesy in Numbers 24, and he says, watch this. Here's amazing, because he's three times he's tried to curse them and whatever, but nonetheless, he says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not now. There shall come forth a star out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel, smite through the corners of Moab, and break down the sons of Tumult. Are you with me? <clears throat> Here's Balaam 
prophesying the coming of the Messiah. It's amazing to me, Lord. So, so, so let me move to the next. I, I told you I was going to make three, um, give you three facts. Well, the first, God's word said he was coming. The second, God gave us his son. In other words, he kept his word. So he says this, the prophets declared it. It was revealed uh, time and again. In fact, John says this in chapter 1 and verse 14, the word, capital W, was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen? Truth, grace and truth. He, he kept his word. Matthew 1 and 21 says, gee, watch this. Um, in Matthew, we're going to find the latter half of chapter 1, the Christmas story there, and in most of chapter 2, um, Luke would give us the account in chapter 2. But I want you to understand something about Jesus. Jesus is the Greek form of the Hebrew name Joshua. Now, I want you to think about that. Who was it that succeeded Moses? His name was Joshua. Jesus being the Greek version of Joshua's name. There's some significance here. And Joshua, or Moses and Joshua, would lead their people. Jesus will likewise lead his. Let me make sense out of this for you. There's a great parallel with Moses, uh, uh, with Jesus, actually, with Matthew, the way he presents Jesus, the Messiah, a great parallel with Moses and Joshua. So, Jesus being the Greek um, form of the Hebrew name Joshua, he, Joshua leads the children of Israel with Moses out of Egypt, but Jesus also leads us out of a spiritual Egypt. Egypt always represented bondage because they were slaves there. It always represented sin. Christ is going to bring us out of the symbolic Egyptian bondage. So then he turned and went into a little town called Nazareth, and I've told you why, so that the prophecy might be fulfilled. I heard an errant um, congressman on TV this past week talking about how, uh, you know, if there had been no wall or whatever, and of course we could get political, please just stay Christmas with me and not political. But the guy misinformed in the sense that, that had there been a wall around Egypt or whatever, he couldn't have got there. I thought to myself, well, I think, I think Nehemiah went back home and built walls around Jerusalem because they had been destroyed 120 years and everybody walked by them, Democrats and Republicans. Well, I don't know if they had that back there. Anyway, but nonetheless, he come home and rebuilt the walls. So, so what I'm saying is, man, people use the Bible all kind of ways, but just so you know. Um, so he turned and he went down. But here, here's what I thought when I saw the congressman say that. I said, no, no, no. Here's the bottom line. It was the word of God that he would go down into Egypt. And he would have done it if there had been a wall or not. Because God would have made a way. And then when he got back, it was also God's will that he would turn aside and go into a town called Nazareth. Because it, is, it was already prophesied that he would be called a Nazarene. And you remember they would later say, what good? could come out of Nazareth. Well, you and I can be saved because of that that came from Nazareth. Are you with me? Say amen. So let me try to move on. So God, he, he turned and went into this little town. So God kept his word uh, for us. Now, I, I need to move on so I can get to the, where I really want to be in this message. God gave us not only the prophecies through his word, he not only gave us his son that came and dwelt among us, but he also gives us life. He gives us life, not just this life, but those who believe on him, he gives us eternal life if we believe in him. John 14, uh, 19, before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you'll see me, and because I live, you shall live also. Nicodemus, you remember Nicodemus? He was part of the Sanhedrin court. He came to Jesus. He said, uh, and Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And how can someone be born when he's old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter into their mother's womb the second time and be born. Well, Jesus went on to tell Nicodemus that you don't understand. As smart as you are, you don't understand. Don't look around right now, but you ever seen any smart, dumb people? <laughs> Just look right at me. I used to call them educated idiots, but uh, I, I don't want to be that harsh no more, so I've, I've gotten saved since then. Uh, <laughs> won't be that cruel anymore, but nonetheless, smart people that do dumb things. Anyway, so, so what Jesus was saying was, if, if you're born again, 
See, we've all been born. I don't think any of us were hatched. Born of water. Uh, ladies, you're familiar with the term breaking water. Yep. So then we're born of water, and then we're born of the Spirit when we get saved. So that's what he was talking about. He gives us eternal life. So now today, I want to talk to you uh, because he has given us his word. He gave us a son, and now uh, he gives us eternal life. There's no doubt about that because if we believe on him, we have eternal life. He told us that he's prepared a place for us, and he's going to you know, come again and receive us under ourself or himself where he is. There we may be also. So, but now I want to talk with you a little bit more about a visit that happened and then I have a question for you. Um, different writers saw it different way. Matthew primarily and then in Luke as well. But we know the story of, of the night Christ was born and the shepherds came and the star guided them and all of these, you understand, all, all these wonderful things. But I, I don't have time to give you the entire deal, but here comes three kings. You remember the three kings? Uh, they come from a long way. They were considered, in, in those days, wise men were astrologers, diviners, sorcerers. And so we're not saying that they were saved men, that they were, that, that they were God-fearing men or whatever. They could have been part, just doing astrology. Okay? But nonetheless, these men came, and I want us to examine the gifts that they brought. I, I wish I had time to tell you more. And let, let me just say it like this. I find it amazing that the king, Herod, who was king, found out about Jesus coming. Because, first of all, Herod was not, <clears throat> if memory serves me right, he was not a natural-born citizen and would not have had a natural claim to the throne, but yet Jesus was. And going into some of the reason why he would want to kill him. So you remember, he, he, when he met with the wise men... They come, he said, hey, where are you going? They said, well, we're going to find where the one is born king of the Jews. We want to worship him. So Herod, lying, like many politicians, says, I too would like to come worship him. He, he didn't want to come worship him. But he inquired of the wise men and found out there's a two-year span there that, that they had talked about. So he, he ordered the execution of all baby boys that were two years old and younger. Isn't that cruel? Could you imagine that? He ordered the execution. But of course, Herod, it wasn't no big deal. He, he executed a wife and some children. Uh, he executed people that, if there's anybody that gave threat to his throne or his reign, it's over for you. Are you with us? That's how it was. So anyway, um, but the wise men came uh, to see him, and then when they came, they brought gifts. Now, I'm going to tell you about these gifts in just a moment, but after they brought their gifts, the Bible says an angel of God came to them and warned them and said, Herod's not telling you the truth. Do not go back to Herod and tell him where the baby's at because he seeks to do him harm. So thank God for wise men, whether they were saved or not. All of a sudden, they bowed before the king of kings. They themselves were kings. They themselves had crowns, and they came and found that one. Maybe they just astrology had told them that over the years, one is going to be born. His name is going to be Messiah. They'll call him Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So they're studying, and all of a sudden, this has come to a reality. Just perhaps, maybe, they knelt before him themselves and perhaps even gave their heart right then. Isn't it amazing that he, Jesus' own earthly king, Herod, hated him, and foreign kings knelt before him? <laughs> I'm having fun. I don't know about you. So they come, these kings come, and they have um, some gifts. I'm going to talk about them real quick. Y'all know the gifts? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So let's talk about them. It's easy to understand why they brought gold. Gold is the metal of royalty. Gold is the medal of a king. <clears throat> Matter of fact, when, when uh, um, uh, Solomon was king, he made 300 shields. Could you imagine a shield? I'm talking about the warriors used to have back in the day. He made 300 shields of beaten gold. And of course, later somebody took them and his son just decided to make some brass ones 
that looked like gold and wasn't as valuable as gold, but that's another story. But gold is the medal of a king. When it's presented to Jesus, it acknowledged his right to rule. The wise men knew that Jesus was the king of kings. So, so gold, they brought gold. That's amazing to me. And then the next thing they brought was frankincense. The incense was used in the temple. They would mix incense with oil and anoint the priest with this oil. Those who looked after the altar and kept the temple in shape and in order. So then we see, not only is there gold, which is the metal of a king, we have incense, the, the frankincense that is part of the temple worship. It was part of the meal offerings where offerings of thanksgiving and praise to God went up. In presenting this gift, the wise men pointed to Christ as our great high priest, the one whose whole life was acceptable and pleasing to the Father. Then there's a weird gift. A mother, I could see, would almost be offended if someone brought this gift. The gift was myrrh. Myrrh was used at the funeral home. Myrrh was what they used to embalm dead people with. And so what kind of gift is this that someone brings gold, someone brings frankincense, and someone brings myrrh? Now, I don't know if each one brought different or if they all brought some of the same I, or, or some of each. I, I don't know. <laughs> but there is some great significance. And while in our Western culture, we would think as a parent, who in the world brings murder to my baby? You know, preparing my baby for the funeral home or for death and burial. And, but you and I understand that Jesus was born to die. We understand that he came on a mission laid aside his robe of divinity and put on the robe of humanity that he might become a servant and dwell among us and be obedient even unto death, that he might become the supreme sacrifice for sin so that those who had been away from God for years, thousands of years, even though they loved God because of sin, they were separated from God, locked away in a place called paradise, and then for the myriad of people that would come after, for the myriad of people that would come after, which is us, Jesus come and became that great sacrifice. So here's what you understand about myrrh. Myrrh was used by, for embalming. And by any human measure, it would be odd, if not even offensive, to present an infant with such a spice. But it was not offensive in this case. Nor was it odd. It was a gift of faith. It was a gift that God is going to bring you in 33 years to the place that he had planned to the place where you agreed to, to become the supreme sacrifice. You see, we do not know it precisely what the wise men may have known or guessed about Christ's ministry, but we do know that the Old Testament again and again and again foretold his suffering. Matter of fact, Isaiah 53, oh boy, would be a great, great example when he said, who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall come forth as a tender plant, as a root out of Jesse. He says, and, and he, talked, he goes on about his sufferings. He says, he'll be smitten and afflicted for our transgressions and bruised and chastised. He said, when we look upon him, we'll see no form nor comeliness that we should desire him. He's despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow and grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. The Bible depicts his great, great suffering. But his suffering would bring our freedom. His suffering would bring our comfort. The chastisement of his peace, our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All of these things Isaiah documented in chapter 53, you'll have to check it out. And so I want to say today that God promised us a son. He gave us his son. So it's a fact. He, he prophesied it. He promised it. It's a fact. He gave him. 
And then uh, another biblical fact is we have, because I live, you live also. Because I've accepted him. For, for he said, if I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth, I shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So if I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth, I am saved. So these three biblical facts, and now one question. The kings, the kings brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. That's, that's what the kings did. We come now to this time of the year. It's, it's Christmas, and I love Christmas season. I do. And it, it's not just because of the gifts. Gifts are one thing, and that's great. And e Even if you don't have money to, to buy physical gifts, to be around the family and to be around friends and love on one another and just cherish the times is a gift in and of itself. But the staff designated about a couple months ago what we would do for Christ's birthday offering. I got a message this morning from someone who could not be here. But they said, Pastor, please fill out an envelope for $500. Me and my wife want to be a part of Christ's birthday offering. I said, thank you so much and Merry Christmas to you. I've prayed about what Kelly and I are going to do. The Christ's birthday offering is, we, as a matter of fact, my apologies, we didn't do one last year. How silly of me. It just got by me. And now you're, you're probably saying, that's a first for a preacher. But you're a wonderful giving church. Tithing and giving is what runs the church. We're able to do, like Santa and S'mores, like the cantata, all of these wonderful things that we've been able to do, it's because somebody was faithful to God in bringing the tithe, that's the tenth of our income, we bring to the Lord and we give an offering or whatever that is. But everybody has an envelope on your seat, or you should, and I want to open that envelope up, and I want to have a look at it real quick on the inside. On the upper left corner, there's a box that says, My Gift. That first line says CBDO, that's Christ's Birthday Offering. So you can do everything in this envelope is what I'm saying. If you still write checks, or if you bring cash, or if you put a note in there, or you write on here and say, I gave X number of dollars electronically, however you've done it, we don't really care. But we want to bring these gifts to the altar. And we're going to do that in just a moment. So I want to challenge you that what the Lord laid on my heart was $20,000 is what it would take us. So I'm going to ask our ushers if you'll just come and stand down this way and then in just a moment I'm on, the ushers are going to stay down here and you guys are going to walk this way as Adam plays. So obviously, I don't even think I have to explain all those other boxes down there, tithing offerings and missions and whatever. You're such wonderful giving people. Had someone bless us last week with a $3,000 missions offering that, that balanced out the budget of Guatemala this past year. Isn't that amazing? But today, I want to urge you, and you just let the Lord lead you. I, because if I have to twist your arm or hold you at gunpoint, I don't, I don't want that. Matter of fact, the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. So I've been asking the Lord, Lord, what is it you want me to cheerfully give? And I've got that right here. And I'm going to put it right here. So I want you to, can you just pray with me for just a moment? Because I don't want to just give, you know, sort of willy-nilly and haphazardly, just grab and... I want to ask the Lord what it is be. So Father, in the name of Jesus, would you speak? To your people right now. I pray, God, that you would just tell us what you'd have us to do. Speak to us, Lord, what it is that you want us to do, and we'll do that. What shall I render unto God for all the manifold blessings he has blessed me with? We understand, Lord, that this offering is for our media upgrade. 
that we can take messages like I preached this morning and literally send them around the world via the internet. That we can take things like our kids program and cantata and various things and for the sick and the shut in and for, for partners that are traveling and partners that have had to move to other places around the world and in the states that they can see and they can see with quality. Lord, I pray for someone that might be watching by way of the internet and say, I want to give. I want to be a part. Maybe you watch this from wherever in the world. I want to be a part of what the harbor's doing. I would like to make a contribution and give likewise. So I pray, Lord, right now that you would bless this offering that is going to help us be excellent in everything we do as it relates to media. In Jesus' name. Amen. So there's several ways, obviously, in, that, in this card. If you've already done it electronically or you want to give electronically, please write on here and let us know what that was anyway. And we're going to get that. I, I know that, but I want you to participate in bringing this card to the altar or to the, uh, to the front in just a moment. Uh, so but there's other ways. There's harborwc.com, some easy instructions there. There's also easy text-to-give instructions. There's iPads in the foyer. And uh, so I want, I want to challenge you, as Adam um, plays right now, would you just make your way when you fill your envelope out? Can we just come and bring our envelopes together right now? Let me say thank you so much for whatever it is. I, I, I'll tell you, I struggled in my own. I said, Lord, what, what do you want me to give? What do you want Kelly and I to give? And Because um, I don't want to ask you to do something that I'm not willing to do myself. I don't want to ask you to sacrifice and me just sort of enjoy, you know, and, and not. No, no. I want to be a part of it. Uh, I want to be able to say, I gave what God laid on my heart. And we'll see, we'll, because I'm convinced, if we all, collectively, all, you know, and that, there's probably, a, um, I don't know, 1,500 people that call the harbor their home, if you count all of them that ever come at all, if we all just obeyed the Lord, there's no telling what we would accomplish. And he, the be beauty is this, that when I obey God, I give, and He gives back, and His hand is so much bigger. I can remember times where I've said things like, Lord, I don't know if I can do this. And about the time I do, next week or the next week or something, boom, God's blessed me and said, look here. And you were doubting. Right? So let me thank you from the bottom of my heart for what you give. Um, we won't know until it'll be tomorrow sometime as far as what happened here. But then there'll be people that were traveling and probably won't be able to finish things out till next week and that's okay too 
But as soon as we know, we'll let you know, and uh, we want to do our very best. Our goal is twenty thousand dollars. We have no idea what how it'll shake out, but uh, I'm just believing God that with His help and our obedience, we'll be there. Amen. God bless you. Um, our ushers are going to serve you. Or serve you again. How about that? Our ushers are done. I know them people are saying, man, look at the preacher, man. He done got, we done brought it, now they're going to come take it. No. <laughs> we cut that out of the tape for the internet. <laughs> anyway, so we've already prayed. Brother Mike is coming now. He's our host today. <clears throat> He's going to share a couple of things with you. God bless you, and I hope you have a very Merry Christmas. And if you travel, be careful and buckle up. All right, God bless you. Amen. Praise God. I tell you what, one thing I love about the harbor is that everything we do here is to reach people. Everything we do. I know for a fact that every time we take an offering and everything that comes into this church is for one reason, and that's to reach souls for Christ. So know that when you give, I love that scripture where that pastor said that, that God loves a cheerful giver, and he loves a cheerful giver. And he's able to make all grace abound towards you, that you having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for what? Every good work. Every good work that God has, it requires something. It requires time, but it also requires finances. And like I said, I love this church because everything we do is to reach people. Everything we do. All those things that Pastor talked about, the Christmas cantata, the kids doing their play, the, the Santa and s'mores. It's to reach people. It's to reach people. It's to have fun, it's to have a good time, but, but it's to reach people that may never come to, to church in a normal setting. So part of that whole media thing is, is to reach people that may not be able to come, that may not be able to get here, may be in a place, may be deployed overseas, and they want to know Christ, and they want to see, and they want to get fed, and it, and it gives us the ability to do that. We have two announcements. Um, Pastor mentioned this already. We will not have a morning or a, a nine o'clock service next week. We will only have a ten thirty. Okay, only everybody ten thirty got it. One service ten thirty. So don't be coming at nine and expecting you know there to be a service. If you do come, just hang out because we'll be here. We'll be here at ten thirty. Um, and the other thing is the church offices. They will be closed this week. They will reopen on the second. So if you need anything, I get you can call up here. It'll go to the to the answering service. If it's an emergency, uh, they'll get back with you. But other than that, the church offices will be closed. If you're traveling, be safe. Have a great Christmas and get that Christmas shopping done if you haven't gotten it done. Because today is the 23rd. So everybody, be blessed. Amen. Y'all dismissed. <laughs>